community. So now um, I have the pleasure to uh, introduce our second uh, speaker, Dr. Dino DiCarlo. So Dino actually is the Alman and the Elena Harapetian Professor of Engineering Medicine at the UCLA. He also is the Vice Chair um, of the Bioengineering uh, Department. Um, and also, Dino is quite, also again, quite embodies the academic entrepreneurship. Uh, besides did a lot of uh, seminal work, he um, actually started um, seven startups, right? Including one that uh, took a, 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 diagnost a sepsis diagnostic assay that got a FDA uh, cleared, a 70 plus company. Dino also, you know, got a NSF, you know, career but PKs award, as people in academia know, that's, you know, I'm, you know, the, the NSF uh, career award is a quite a prestigious one. The P case is really the top of the uh, crop that you know get to get to go to, go to the White House. So it's really quite an honor. Uh, again, there's also many other um, kind of really kind of um, the uh, accolade of Dr. DeCaro. But anyway, um, here we have the pleasure today for him to talk about the latest nanotechnology uh, he's working on. Thank you. Well, thanks, thanks so much. Huh? Thanks so much, Shiling. Thanks for the invitation to come speak today. Um, I, I really, this is an amazing conference and an amazing vision um, that, that we have here at, as part of the Terasaki Institute um, for translation as being um, you know, the primary goal, not you know, that paper, um, not you know, the academic work, but really how do we think from first principles about projects at the very beginning for how it can impact patients. Uh, and so I think that's something that we, really resonates with me. Um, and what I want to talk about today and share with you is um, work that we're been, we've been doing to kind of uh, help the translation of, of research by scaling the foundational uh, technologies to analyze cells, and particularly to analyze single cells. And we, we had a great presentation from uh, Professor Mooney and, and Professor Langer about um, where, where, you know, scaling of uh, the, the fundamental automation tools could be helpful, for example, in cell therapies and developing new vaccines and developing new drugs. Um, so I want to I want to start though by um, kind of laying out where I think engineering can impact medicine and how we think about this in our lab. Uh, and, and and first, as I mentioned, we think about automating discoveries being a key aspect of where engineering impacts medicine, um, and you know the tools that we have to. Uh, perform life science research really uh, is, is lays the foundation for how, how quickly we can come up with new discoveries. Um, and, and, and we're at the state now where we can develop tools that can screen and, and characterize biology at its ultimate limits, like what I call the quantum limits of biology, uh, single cells and single molecules, right? So you don't really want to look at half a cell, you don't really want to look at half a a protein or half a nucleic acid, but we're at the state now where we have technologies that can, in a scalable way, characterize cells uh, and, and single cells and single molecules. But there's some limitations, and I'll talk more about that, and that's where engineering can be helpful. Uh, quantifying self, you're going to hear a great talks, I'm sure, from uh, Joe, Joe Wong, uh, Professor Joe Wong at UCSD and others, on how do we sense um, the our, ourselves, the environment, uh, the chemical environment, not just the, the physiological environment, um, and, and use that as a way to have precision and, and, and preventative medicine where we can, at the, at the earliest stages, um, uh, you know, uh, understand if a disease process is happening and, and, and circumvent it. Um, and, and this has had a huge jump with the COVID pandemic. We had a lot of at-home tests um, that were developed and, and uh, you know, some of the first at-home molecular diagnostic tests that uh, now has opened the floodgates to this, this ability for us to have uh, quantifying self be a, something that we can control and is not, um, you know, as, a, as an individual and is not really um, uh, something where the, the health system is, is, uh, is the, the arbiter of, of, of our own data, right? Um, Biohybrid systems is another big area where we're thinking about how do we use microtechnology engineering to really create that interface between biology, communicate at the, the language of cells. Some of the work we heard from Dr. Mooney is really about how do we communicate with cells, right? How do we create materials that can communicate with cells? Um, of course, we can have electronic systems, et cetera, 
that also can communicate with cells like neurons. And here's a picture of the retinal prosthesis developed by um, some of the uh, uh, professors here at UCLA, Wen Tai Lu and others. And finally, I think this is a key part. We heard about uh, the cell therapy field here and how manufacturing is a bottleneck in cell therapy field. Uh, the price point for a single personalized uh, dose has been uh, you know, quoted in the range of about half a million dollars. Um, and democratizing access, making this from an artisanal process of creating cell therapies or other therapies to an industrial process, I think that's an area that uh, there's a lot of impact needed. So I'm going to focus on um, the automation of discovery and really the automation of discovery of therapeutics. And, and I want to highlight how I, I think about therapeutics as in these three pillars. Um, and and this, this also reflects things that we heard earlier where we have um, you know, molecular therapies. That's kind of been the mainstay of the pharmaceutical industry for the last uh, almost century. Um, you know, small molecule therapeutics. More recently, uh, protein-based therapeutics, especially monoclonal antibodies. And uh, uh, you know, monoclonal antibodies now uh, are almost a majority, about five out of 10 of the top blockbuster drugs are, are based on monoclonal antibodies. Um, and then of course, we, we heard about mRNA therapeutics and RNA therapeutics being also a, a really important new area that's, that's arising. You know, the, the key here in discovering new monoclonal antibodies is analyzing the cells that produce them. So plasma cells uh, that produce and secrete these, these cells or, or memory B cells. Um, and so the, the single cell analysis piece and ability to analyze more and more of these is a, a critical factor. In fact, during the, the pandemic, some of these micro-scale tools, um, for example, from Absolera and from companies like Berkeley Lights with uh, folks at, like Jim Crow at Vanderbilt, were led to really rapid discovery of monoclonal antibodies that were used as neutralizing antibody therapeutics in, in, in helping patients during the pandemic. The second um, column here, gene therapies. We've seen now FDA approvals of some of the first gene therapies against some rare uh, you know, genetic diseases. And of course, we have huge numbers of new tools now, CRISPR-based or other uh, you know, edit, gene editing-based tools that are, are making this, this field rapidly advance. Um, and I think the other piece here is analyzing cells and how they produce, for example, vectors to deliver gene therapies. How can we get these cells to produce even more vectors? That's a, a, a process that analyzing individual cells that are producing virus, for example, can really help and accelerate. And then finally, we heard great, uh, uh, you know, a great introduction and, and, and discussion of the challenges with cell therapies and, and their promise. Um, you know, for example, uh, you know, and, and, you know, I won't have to go into detail here, but uh, chimeric antigen receptor therapies, TCR-based therapies, engineered TCR-based therapies, also other cell types like natural killer cells. Um, but and we're also seeing, uh, of course, applications for other types of cells that secrete therapeutic products. Uh, whether it's insulin or whether it's uh, cells that produce growth factors like mesenchymal stromal cells that produce uh, vascular endothelial growth factor for regenerative purposes. So, um, of course, they're, again, analyzing individual cells and what their functions are. That We heard that from Professor Mooney, that function is really critical here. Um, that If we can have tools to do that at scale, um, that can be really, really, uh, really valuable to accelerate the discovery of, of these therapeutics. Um, and I like to I like to think about uh, and, and this is something that that was also discussed in, in the and it, so it's great that we came in this order, uh, but living drugs need new tools to characterize them, right? So, um, as we heard, you know, small molecule drugs, proteins, monoclonal antibodies, structure and function are linked, right? So if I know the structure and I can characterize that structure, I can more or less understand the function. But for cells, that's not the case, right? You have inputs, right? You can, you can engineer the cells with particular DNA, uh, but of course you have epigenetic modifications of that DNA. You have the environmental conditions in which those cells were grown, as we heard, and all of that will af affect the final phenotype. So in the end, we need tools to characterize that phenotype sort cells based on those phenotypes, just like in the pharmaceutical industry, we have tools to sort uh, you know, uh, uh, chemicals based on, on, on sort of their, their, their properties as well that are eventually useful for, for their use. So, um, so this is what we're focusing on, is, is tools for automation of uh, the characterization of individual cells. 
Um, but we need to match the scale of biology to do this well, right? So the kind of standard lab automation tools make use of biological vessels to do biology that are things like well plates, things like even multi-well plates. Uh, still, the volumes of a you know, 1536 well plate are thousands of times larger than an individual cell. And that represents a barrier. Let's say that we're interested in what that individual cell is doing, what it's secreting, that all that information that's being released from that cell now gets diluted out in this milieu of you know, thousand times larger than it. Um, and so this is where you need, uh, we, we, you know, the, the, one of the key aspects here is can we create volumes, create um, uh, way, compartments that allow us to characterize uh, cells at th that length scale, at that volume scale of a single cell. Microfluidics has been a really great way to do this over the years. Um, but what, what we found is that uh, many of these microfluidic systems have been quite niche for each particular application. And we've, you know, as, as mentioned, we've commercialized microfluidic systems, but the adoption curve, how do we get the technology out there so that more people can use it more rapidly? You know, one of the goals of the, these types of, uh, you know, uh, meetings uh, is, is hindered by the fact that we're not leveraging the infrastructure of, of, of life science research. So in our case, the focus was, can we leverage you know, flow cytometers, can we leverage single cell sequencing instruments that are already available in research labs to perform similar types of single uh, cell type assays. And so this is the, um, you know, the, 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 I guess, where lab on a particle technology that we've been developing comes into play. It's a, an approach that we can create basically vessels at the size, length scale of a cell that have functionality to capture cells, analyze things that they secrete, but are also uh, compatible with the infrastructure of biology that's out there in the research labs today. Okay, so what are, what are um, you know, these lab on our particle technologies? I want to talk about one, uh, which we call a nanovial. A nanovial is a, uh, a hydrogel particle. It has a cavity that's less than a nanoliter, so that's the name nanovial. If we called it a microvial, you would think I was talking about microfuge tubes, so that's why we don't call it that. Um, and uh, you, know, you can have millions of these in a tube. Cells um, can go into these things and we can perform assays on them. Um, so this is uh, a video that just shows some of these, these nanovials settling uh, in, in, a, in a channel here. So you can see that they, they have this uh, shape, kind of a moon shape in cross section, but there's an empty cavity, uh, basically a, a bowl shaped cavity. And that's where, um, you know, similar to like a, a little mini a test tube, right? So the cells can go into that cavity, the things that they secrete can be captured. We can make these very precisely, um, uh, you know, with very, uh, uh, w w with very low um, deviations in, in, in kind of their diameters and, and the cavity sizes using microfluidic tools. Um, so these, these nanovials, they can create uniform compartments. They have a solid phase to which you can perform reactions. Think you can capture things that the cells are secreting. You can also uh, use the solid phase as a, as a way to have an artificial antigen presenting uh, you know, a cell kind of surface. Um, and you can uh, analyze and sort them in, in high throughput. So this is just kind of a schematic of what, what this might look like. Um, you know, we're seeing that you have, uh, you, you can have, uh, you know, cells that bind to the surface of these nanovials. You can also have antibodies that are functionalized onto the nanovial surface that capture cytokines, for example, that the cells secrete or antibodies that the cells secrete. When this happens, you, you'll see, you know, these are the types of pictures that you see if we fluorescently label what those cells secrete. So pink, you see the cells. In green, you see some of the secretions from the individual cells. Um, and again, the key, one of the key aspects is the compatibility with the infrastructure that's in place in biology labs. Flow cytometers is a big one. So that means that these uh, nanovials can go into the flow cytometer just like a cell would, and you can analyze both the cell that's there, but also the functions of that cell, like for example, things that it secretes. This slide didn't come out exactly uh, as planned, but suffice to say the processes for using these types of nanovials are standard processes that biologists can, can take advantage of and use normally in their research labs. So you load cells, you mix them up with the nanovials, you incubate for, for a period of time to allow them to attach. Uh, you then can stain, you allow them to incubate uh, and secrete. Uh, 
uh, you, you, you can then stain with antibodies to things that those cells are secreting, and then you can sort and analyze. You can do downstream growth to grow up populations of cells that have certain functions uh, or your productivity of a particular, let's say, uh, if it's a producing um, uh, monoclonal antibodies. And you can also put these nanovials into um, single cell sequencing workflows. So they can go directly into 10x uh, genomics chromium workflow for those you know, maybe familiar with doing single cell sequencing. That's kind of one of the standard um, um, uh, instruments for that. Uh, and so, so these nanovials with the cell goes directly into these droplets from, for single cell sequencing. And so you can get both functional information and you can start to link that to uh, transcriptomic information, the instruction sets for the cell. So we'll talk about some of these applications. Just briefly, we fabricate, uh, you know, this is kind of, uh, uh, you know, we use the tools we have to make even smaller tools. Um, so we use microfluidics to make these particles. We use a coflow geometry. We create an aqueous two-phase system uh, that those two, assist the, those two phases phase separate. We have one of the phases be polymerizable. We can then polymerize it with UV light and then uh, we can uh, remove the other phase that's internal and that creates a cavity. So it's like sacrificial process. We create a little bowl-shaped cavity in a hydrogel particle. We also usually functionalize these particles with things like biotin so that we can start to perform chemistry on the particles. Um, so, you know, we, we're, we're calling this, you know, microfluidics 2.0 in that uh, it's a, a different way to do microfluidics um, and using particles. Um, but it has the same kind of key features of compartmentalization that are key for some of these other microfluidic applications. This is relatively new to us in our lab, and that's why I wanted to share it, because I'm really excited about it. Um, and, and you can see some of the kind of work that's coming out of this. I'm going to talk about two key areas that we're, we're using this. One that really dovetails on, on what Dr. Mooney was talking about, where we are um, uh, discovering new T cell receptors using this technique and, and connecting the function uh, of those T cells, what they secrete, what cytokines they secrete to the, T, the, the, the TCR sequences so that we can uh, refine our ability to discover uh, high quality TCRs. And the other where, um, as I mentioned, we're linking the um, secretory function of a, of, a, um, of a cell to the transcriptome of that cell to identify what's driving uh, that particular functional phenotype. Okay, so first step, like, how do we load cells onto these nanovials? This is a common question we, we get. Um, well, we can have various different approaches to do this. One is we can have antibodies on the surface of the nanovial that recognize cell surface proteins on the target cell. So an example um, for plasma cells, we use anti-CD138 to capture plasma cells and link them to the surface of the nanovial. We can also put antigen or peptide MHC, um, we heard about that earlier, on nanovials and then selectively target either chimeric antigen receptor uh, T cells or uh, uh, specific antigen-specific T cells. We can also add um, extracellular matrix proteins like gelatin, and then we can uh, load things, uh, other adherent cells like mesenchymal stromal cells um, or uh, other peptides to, to, to link other cells. So, um, you know, I think the, the nice thing here is you can have either nonspecific approaches to load cells or very specific approaches to, to pr perform an enrichment step for a subpopulation of cells prior to the analysis. So I want to first talk about um, some work that's been led by, I think she's here, one of the PhD students in the lab, uh, Felice, along with um, Mao. Uh, these are, uh, who, who's in, working in, the, in Owen Witte's lab here at UCLA. So this has been a great collaboration, uh, translational collaboration, where we're from the engineering to, to medicine, uh, working together to do functional screening of T cells. In particular, identifying T cell receptors, I won't to belabor this because we heard about it earlier, but this is really can be very promising uh, approaches for cancer treatment if we find you know, particular neoantigens or neoepitopes as we heard earlier uh, for a particular patient. We can engineer, we can find TCRs that recognize those neoantigens and neoepitopes, engineer uh, cells to, pr to produce many of those TCRs uh, and then infuse those into patients to kill tumors, ideally. Um, 
So, um, so one of the, the challenges here is I finding TCRs. So finding the, one of the key aspects, right, is the recognition event. What is a good TC? What makes up a good T cell receptor? Um, you know, we want you want the cells to also not just have affinity, but be able to secrete uh, perforin, ganzyme, secrete other cytokines. Um, so the approach that we take is that we bind, we, we put peptide MHC and uh, anti-interferon gamma capture antibody on our nanovials. Uh, we, ha we can then enrich cognate uh, T cells that bind the peptide MHC, but then uh, we also activate those T cells through that interaction, and then they secrete cytokines that we can then capture on the nanovial. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the question is, can we do, can we bind these cells and can we then activate them uh, by this interaction? And, and so the, the, the quick answer is yes, we can do that. I'll show some data. Uh, and then really we want to use that then to identify and select rare antigen specific T cells um, uh, that have this functional phenotype that they start to secrete. Uh, and, you can, and we will show you, we can, we can look at other cytokines as well and then sequence those TCRs and then start to link some of these functional behaviors to the sequence. Okay, so this is the workflow here. Um, we, again, we, we label our nanovials with the peptide MHC, with the antibodies against the cytokines, and we also add, in this case, a oligonucleotide barcode onto the nanovial that represents which peptide MHC was labeled on that nanovial. So this allows us to screen many uh, you know, a multitude of peptide MHCs along and find TCRs against all of those at the same time. Maybe that you want to look at different HLA types all at the same time, or you, you want to look at many different um, neoantigenic peptides uh, from the antigens of interest. We load T cells, we allow them to secrete, we then uh, you know, label the, the secretions, we can also label the surface markers on the T cells, CD3, CD8, um, in this case, and then we, we sort out the CD3, CD8 positive cells that also secrete interferon gamma above a certain level. Uh, and then we, we, we have those go into a single cell sequencing workflow for the VDJ sequencing to identify alpha and beta chain of the TCR. Um, we can also look at proliferation afterwards. So this process works. I'm not going to kind of dwell on the data here, but um, NGFR is our marker for the uh, this, in this case, we started off with an engineered TCR, uh, 1G4 TCR, um, uh, and, and uh, this is against NYESO1. Um, we enriched, we, can, we see that we can enrich based on the NGFR marker, the antigen-specific T cells, um, and we see, also see that uh, you know, if the cells are not transduced with the 1G4, they don't get enriched. And if they're not transduced with 1G4 or there's no peptide MHC on the nanovial, they don't secrete interferon gamma when, when bound to the nanovial. Um, we can look at you know, what, what's kind of the limits of detection here, and, and I'll, I'll, I won't spend too much time on this, but uh, the, the, the key point here is that we can dilute these down to like 1 in 30,000, and we can still enrich those populations of functional T cells that have uh, that, that TCR um, over a thousand fold, even at these very low dilution ratios. Um, and so we, we then applied this. Um, so so there, we did other work where you looked at many other T, uh, engineered TCRs, and we, we also can find these low affinity TCRs, which is really, really exciting because that is difficult to find with some of the other approaches that use tetramers or, or dextramers to, to label uh, T cells. Um, so we then went to a, a full, uh, an assay where we are trying to then find um, new TCRs from donors. Uh, these are PBMCs from donors that were pre-activated with a peptide pool from cytomegalovirus and Epstein-Barr virus. Um, and then we had nanovials that had, uh, that had specific peptide MHCs and that were barcoded, as I mentioned. And then we then um, take that pool of activated cells, PBMCs, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, uh, load them onto the nanovials. Uh, they will load in an affinity, uh, you know, when they bind, the antigen-specific cells will load. If they um, get activated, they'll start to secrete cytokines, and then we can sort out that subpopulation. So we compared that, that protocol. Uh, we, we then, you know, do downstream TCR recovery. We compared that protocol with just directly labeling with these tetramers of, of peptide MHCs, or um, uh, looking at an activation marker like CD, uh, in this case, CD137. 
um, I'm, you know, we, 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 can, we basically will gate out, uh, we use flow cytometry. I think that was one of the key points I wanted to mention, right? We're using flow cytometry, we're using standard tools to do this. Uh, so we gate out our single T cells on the nanovials. We gate out the ones that are, uh, you know, our cytotoxic T cells, CD3, CD8 positive cells. And then we gate out based on the amount of interferon gamma signal. We sort all of those cells, and then those go into the 10x uh, workflow. So what, what came out of this results, uh, out of these? So one, uh, you know, we could, we could uh, recover the, the VJ spanning pairs in our multiplex nanovial sample uh, in, in the majority of the cells, so 90 plus percent, which is more or equivalent or more than all the other, the other techniques, which we don't have nanovials, right? So it's just directly cells, CD137 or, or tetramer-based staining. Um, and the recovered um, clonotypes that we find um, in the nanovial system uh, are greatly uh, expanded compared to what we find looking at tetramers alone. So I think that's one of the key things. It, they overlap a lot with the activation markers, but uh, we're also getting the cognate peptide MHC information, which you don't get with the activation markers. So, um, so it has kind of the advantages of the activation markers. You get a large diversity of TCRs. Um, but, uh, which is more than the tetramers, but we also get the target information for those TCRs, which is great. We then went back and like, okay, well, we got all these new TCR sequences. Are they actually functional, right? So we put them back into cells, then characterize their function. We started off with this jerk cat uh, NFAT reporter line, which tells us, you know, if the, uh, the TCR is engaged and, and, and there's activation occurring with GAP fluorescence. Uh, what we find is that, uh, again, we have greater diversity, and the majority of the, the TCRs that we find, is, in this case, it's 75% of the, the cell clonotypes um, were functional upon re-expression. Um, and, and so you can see here the differences between the tetramer, which are in dark blue, and the nanovial uh, uh, systems where we're getting additional TCRs that are functional. We also see EBV-specific TCRs in this case because they were barcoded. Uh, the barcoding accuracy was 100% in this case, so 100% accuracy in finding, uh, matching the TCR with the cognate epitope. We then go on to test those same uh, TCRs now in primary cells looking at uh, interferon gamma secretion when exposed to antigen-presenting cells. And we find, again, that these, these TCRs that we find are functional. Uh, and so, again, as, as I mentioned, greater than 75% hit rate, um, which, is, which is quite good when, when we talk to our, our collaborators, where normally you're, you're finding TCRs and maybe 10% to 20% are actually functional upon re-expression. Um, we can then uh, kind of expand this type of a pro a process to looking at m not just a single cytokine, but cells that secrete multiple cytokines. So in this case, we are looking at T cells that were specific to prostate-specific uh, prostate antigen PAP. Um, and uh, we're looking at three different uh, engineered uh, uh, TCRs that we're introducing into, into T cells that, and looking at interferon gamma and TNF al alpha expression, uh, or, or not expression, secretion. So we're looking at the function of these cells. Uh, and what we find is actually, depending on the TCR, there's different levels of T cells that secrete uh, one of these cytokines each or, or the combination of these cytokines. So this is kind of, unclear why are certain cells secreting multiple cytokines, why are other cells secreting only a single cytokine, why are the majority of these cells actually not secreting any cytokines, any of these two cytokines. Um, and so, so this now kind of opens up questions of like, can we start to match this with other information about these cells uh, to, un to understand what's leading to this, what we think is a more functional phenotype. Uh, and, and there's been work um, from, from others. I think generally there's, there's a company called Isoplexus that has uh, kind of coined this term of polyfunctional cells that secrete multiple cytokines. And that there seems to be some correlation between that polyfunctionality and in vivo eff efficacy of the, of the cells. Yeah, so it's showing some of, uh, some of these uh, gates that where we can screen out cells that are TNF alpha interferon gamma double positive. Uh, they're secreting both of those cytokines. Uh, you can see that on, on the nanovials here. 
Okay, so uh, this concludes kind of the first use case of these nanovials that I wanted to share today, um, where we can develop antigen-presenting nanovials that uh, do have fun enable functional secretion-based sorting, um, and we can then construct single-cell TCR libraries and show that the majority of those are functional, that those TCR libraries also have expanded breadth and matching epitope information because of the way that we barcode the nanovials. Um, and then future work is really exploring this idea that can we select out polyfunctional cells and start to connect that relationship with maybe the TCR sequence and maybe other aspects of the molecular profile of those cells. And ideally that would lead then to maybe better, uh, you know, better therapeutic cells in the future. I want to then transition to um, another use case of the technology, uh, which we call secretion encoded single cell sequencing or seq seq. Uh, <laughs> so, this is work, I think, uh, I think Shreya is here, maybe Justin. Um, so, Shreya, a PhD student in my lab, has been leading this work uh, along with uh, Justin, who is a uh, researcher in the Catherine Plass lab here. So again, another collaborative effort across engineering and, and uh, biology and medicine. So the, what are we doing with SeqSeq? We are, um, we are measuring functional properties, the secretions of cells, and we're linking that with the transcriptomes of those same cells. So this is the workflow. We start with nanovials. We, um, again, load our cells onto the nanovials. They also have capture antibodies for secretions from those cells. The cells secrete. Instead of a fluorescent antibody, or we can add a fluorescent as well, instead of a fluorescent, in many cases, we'll add an oligonucleotide labeled antibody. That then allows us to measure the amount of those antibodies uh, in a single cell sequencing workflow and then link that to the transcriptome for that same cell. Uh, so that nanovial and cell with the oligonucleotide labeled antibody goes into a droplet. That droplet has a, a unique barcoded bead. Uh, that barcoded bead dissolves and includes, has primers uh, that are, are uh, you know, that, that, that they can amplify, um, uh, that allow us to create cDNA from both the, the transcripts of the cell, mRNA transcripts of the cell, as well as the oligonucleotide barcode. So that gives us, and they all have the same barcode for that was that cell, right? That B, that cell. So that allows us to link the information about the secretion for that cell with its transcriptome. So briefly, I'm just going to, um, Kind of, I, I won't spend too much time, but we did a lot of validation to, that this workflow can actually uh, function and that we get data that actually makes sense. Um, so we have to first validate, uh, in this case, the, the assay itself. And here we're looking at uh, VEGF A secretion from, so vascular endothelial growth factor secretion from mesenchymal stromal cells. Um, so this is important if you think about a therapeutic aspect of, of, uh, that's been proposed for these cells is that they can be regenerative, they, they secrete growth factors that uh, assist with blood vessel formation and regeneration. In fact, we heard about blood vessel formation in the first talk this morning, right, and, and the anti-angiogenic uh, uh, therapeutics that, that are being developed. Um, so here we, we looked at, uh, first had to develop the assay to characterize VEGF secretion using fluorescence. Um, and that works quite well, so we developed that assay. And then we had to show that these nanovials don't interfere with the chemistry and the droplets that, that we need to do the single cell sequencing. So that was, uh, we were able to do that. Um, and so I'm just gonna jump to some of the data we're able to collect with this platform, which is really uh, elucidating um, things that we were, aren't, weren't able to really understand before because there wasn't a tool like this before. So, um, so here what we did is we took mesenchymal stromal cells that were exposed uh, to media that was normoxic as well as hypoxic conditions. Um, and we looked at the transcriptome, but we also added on that layer of VEGF secretion. So what we see is quite, uh, just on a general level is the normoxic cells, they have less uh, VEGF secretion uh, on average, uh, which, which makes sense um, compared to hypoxic cells. Um, and they have less VEGF transcripts on average compared to hypoxic cells, but it's not evenly distributed, right? So there are subpopulations. We see, we see this, um, for example, here and here that have very high levels of VEGF secretion. Um, and so the question is, is that associated with VEGF transcripts or are there other, other pathways which are driving that secretion? 
Okay, so we looked at those populations. In particular, we're looking at, you know, so, oops. So in particular, we're looking at this, this relationship between VEGF transcripts and VEGF secretion, right? So these two plots on the top left there. So you can see the transcripts are generally driven to be much higher in hypoxic cells, but that's not necessarily the same as where the high secretion is occurring, right? So this is really was quite interesting. There's this population, uh, the M1 population in particular, that has very high levels of secretion. They're close together in the transcript space between the hypoxic and the normoxic cells, um, but is, is kind of independent of the transcript level. Um, so, oops, you can see that. And so you can see this here that, uh, you know, normoxic ce cells in the M1 have some amount of VEGF transcripts, so they, they have to produce it a little bit, but much lower than hypoxic, but they are also have high levels of VEGF secretion. So this is interesting. So there's this, un, this lack of correlation between the transcripts for this secreted protein and the amount that's secreted. Um, and so this is something that's really important because as biologists we, uh, and engineers, we often think that those are linked, right? Oh, there's high expression of VEGF, so that means there must be high secretion of VEGF. But that, you know, this is now saying that we have to be cautious about that, that there might be other things that are driving that secretion besides the transcripts level. In fact, we find that, you know, even though VEGF transcripts are poorly correlated uh, with, with secretion, uh, a little bit highly better correlated in hypoxic cells, um, the, there are other genes which are very highly correlated with VEGF secretion. So uh, genes like IGF-BP5, IGF-BP6, these are insulin-like growth factor binding proteins that is very little is actually known about what they do. Um, and, and so, so there's something that, that's kind of exciting is there, can you start to um, you know, make use of this to, to develop uh, and engineer cells to produce higher levels of VEGF? So, so this is, these are some of the high correlates um, and we can actually define um, a new signature we call the vascular regenerative signature based on the high correlates. Um, and then when we do a repeat study, and so this is just a repeat of the study where we looked at uh, normoxic cells, we still find this uh, population, uh, subpopulation of cells that has high VEGF secretion and has this vascular regenerative signal. Um, and it is defined by some of these other genes like IG, the IGF-BPs, um, TIMP3, et cetera. Um, so this across many, many um, different experiments, you can see this uh, we call VRS or vascular regenerative gene signature appears in a subpopulation of these MSCs. Um, and so that's, that's kind of exciting. It has some gene ontologies that uh, are associated with, with cell uh, proliferative, proliferation and, and regeneration, blood vessel development. Um, but it's not defined by any one of those previous gene ontologies. So it's a new gene ontology that's associated with this subpopulation. Uh, and so, you know, this now is, is really exciting because it, it allows us to start think about, thinking about, you know, how we can uh, use these tools to uh, get back to the function of cells. How can we use these tools to engineer back to the function of cells, not are they expressing this gene or not, but are they actually functional? Are they secreting this? And that would be a functional therapeutic. And we think that, um, you know, that this functional aspect is really critical for single cell analysis to move that field forward, to move our ability to um, engineer cells for therapeutics in, in, a, in a more uh, rational and defined way. Okay. So maybe to kind of uh, wrap up a, a bit before for, for some questions. Um, so we, you know, the, the idea here at, at the beginning, it was like, okay, how are we scaling biological research? Um, and so, you know, the, the, the comparison here is with the 1536 well plate. So here, 1536 well plate, uh, you have these robotic instruments that can, can work with it. You have one to 10 microliters of sample. Um, we have a nanovial. Uh, you have less than a nanoliter in each of these samples, so it's a thousand times smaller volume that allows you to concentrate, obviously, the signal that's being produced by uh, in cells in, the, in, in, those, in those small volumes almost a thousand fold. And we can look at a thousand fold more compartments. So we're looking at uh, you know, hundreds of thousands to millions of these nanovials as we do flow cytometry experiments. 
And so that allows you to look for even rarer populations uh, and, and really get statistical robustness in, in your results. Um, and, and then the other piece of this is you can start to sort populations based on those functional outputs, right? Uh, so again, using flow cytometry tools, fluorescence activated cell sorting tools uh, to sort based on uh, the, the results of those functional experiments uh, and, and then now perform downstream assays on, on the, the, those functional cells, the, the, the cells that were selected based on function. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I think, so that, really excited about to share this with you um, and acknowledge some of our, uh, the folks that have worked on this, um, including uh, my students here. Uh, and if they have quite, I'll probably put, point to them if there are very detailed questions because they're gonna be the best person, best people to answer that. Our, our collaborators, uh, Catherine Plath's lab here at UCLA, uh, Owen Witte's lab here at UCLA, uh, and as well as Justin and Mao. Uh, we also collaborate with, with others on, on using nanovials, Jamie Spengler, Jonathan Schneck over at John Hopkins, uh, as well as Richard James, who's, uh, I didn't get to talk about his really, really interesting use case where he wants to understand why plasma cells secrete high levels of IG, IgG, or when you look at a distribution of plasma cells, there are some that secrete more, some that secrete less, and why are the ones that secreting more, secreting more? What's the transcriptome, what's the, you know, what's the underlying um, programs that lead to high levels of secretion? Of course, that can be also helpful to create new therapeutic cells that secrete high levels of a protein or, or IgG that, that, that's a therapeutic. Um, so with that, I will uh, say you know, thanks, thanks again and happy to take questions. The uh, Seek Seek's really cool. Um, and Rich Thank James, you. Rich James's application is also really cool. But the question is, um, what is the saturation level? How many protein molecules can you detect from a single cell? That's and a, that's, can you multiplex it? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think one, one area that, uh, let me see if I can go back to some of the data here. And the students can, can chime in as well. But uh, yeah, I think this, this uh, data here might be a good, good example. So, so here we, we dose the VEGF concentration. This is on the nanovial. And we looked at the fluorescent signal. So you can see over a range of uh, you know, 10 to the third to 10 to the, to 10 to the fifth or so, um, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing a, a linear range uh, for, for detection. Um, uh, and uh, so we're, we're normally looking at, you know, um, thousandfold, 100 to 1,000 fold sort of dynamic range. As you add more different um, antibodies to capture different secretions, then, right, you're, you're going to reduce your dynamic range um, uh, based on the, you know, if, if this, you say you add 10 different capture antibodies, you might get a tenfold reduction in the dynamic range. But, um, you know, that's something that, th as an engineering uh, lab, we can also work on how do we improve that dynamic range further if needed. So far, we haven't had that need. Because what we do is we dose the, uh, we, we time the experiments so that we don't hit that saturation, right? So let's say three hours or 12 hours of secretion, depending on, on the experiment. Yeah. I have a follow-up question, and uh, you know, we try to get it back on time, so we try to keep the question answers short, but, yeah. uh, but it's so fascinating. Thank you very much. I have two questions. One is, is there a way you can imagine using this technology to actually capture cell-cell interaction? Let's say getting two cells in there, right? If you have a AppChem to capture yeah. a tumor cell plus a DC cell plus a T cell. That, that seemed yeah. to be really, you know, will change the field. Uh, yeah, no, ex exactly. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, you know, two cells, can we look at, uh, you know, um, dendritic cell, uh, other cell? So actually, Felice was doing these experiments um, just very recently where we're looking at T cell antigen presenting cells and, and interacting and then looking at secretions from the T cells being captured. So, yes, yeah, um, I think there are some workflow challenges we're still working through on how to load and control the number of different cells in each nanovial, but uh, in, in, in principle, it is possible and we have some preliminary data on it, yeah. Second is a technical question, right? When you're measuring cytokine in each nanovial, like when, but when, you, when you're kind of adding the antibody to each vial, like is there a way to ensure 
that they are very uniform, right? For example, you see, oh, this one interferon gamma higher. Is it really it's higher? It's because happened that vial happened to be loaded by more, like you know, con you know, antibodies, right? Yeah, that's a great question. So the way that we we um, kind of functionalize the nanovials is in a solution phase, um, and so we are usually. Um, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're kind of using processes that you would use to label cells. So, so we're, we're mixing and, and uh, you know, we're, we're adding at, at concentrations that, um, uh, you know, that, that we are not, um, uh, we're not expecting to have uh, huge heterogeneity because uh, you're, so we initially found this for like streptavid and biotin. That's a very strong high affinity interaction. If you, you had a really high concentration of streptavid and you add it, uh, to you know a, a solution where there's some heterogeneity in it, you can get heterogeneity in the streptavidin loading. Um, but if you mix it at a lower concentration initially, um, and you, um, uh, you 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 can kind of keep uh, mixing the sample or you saturate the sample, then you don't have those issues of, of heterogeneity. In it. Thank you, uh, Diet Mutmacher, Australia. You mentioned the upscaling at the beginning, right? So that's obviously still an issue with, uh, with the microfluidics. So, yeah. W what are the solutions? And then, in respect to the materials, you can get this very nice distribution, this precision. How many different materials have you tried which work? Yeah. So, it's towards the first question, I think the scaling. Which we really like this platform. Um, because there is no new instrumentation required. So the infrastructure is there. We just ship uh, you know, a vial of nanovials. So example, our collaborators in Richard James' lab and uh, J uh, Johns Hopkins, we, during the pandemic, we were working with them, sending them nanovials, right? There was no, we didn't have to go there in person. We, so, uh, and then there's, so I, I had showed in, on, in the last acknowledgement slides, uh, there, there is uh, a company that started off of this, uh, Partillion Bioscience, and they, they can ship reagents. It's a reagent that they ship to uh, customers, and then they can operate on the instruments that they already have. It's compatible with almost any flow cytometer that we've tested so far. Um, and so, so that addresses some of the scaling issues, right? So we, uh, we just produce lots of particles, ship them out to all the, all the folks. Uh, they don't have to adopt new uh, instruments and they don't have to, you know, and the, the cost associated with that. Um, the second part of your question was the material, material flexibility. Um, so we use polyethylene glycol as the base material for these, these nanovial hydrogels. Um, but um, we can also, we've used different formulations of that that have slightly different functionalities. Uh, we, we have a, a version that has gelatin coating just in the cavity. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, as long as you can form these aqueous two-phase systems, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of maybe flexibility in the types of materials. Um, but usually we're using a PEG-based material because that's, that's um, easier to, to form these a a APTS systems, these aqueous two-phase systems. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.